Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, not more. So I was actually kind of feeling like a little bit tired of filming after, you know, reading Emma so closely and carefully and doing so many updates about it. And I don't know, I just wasn't feeling like being in the mood. It's hard to get in the habit to do, you know, so many frequent updates and getting so much content out. But the minute I hit the record button, I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy to be here and to be talking with you guys again. And um, hopefully, even though Emma's not my favorite book, hopefully you enjoyed the discussion anyway. And I was able to finish reading it this weekend. So I just have a couple of things to wrap up. And then I want to tell you about the next book that I'm starting to read. So let me get my notes out here. Uh, one thing that I thought was really interesting, and this goes back to my discussion of the value of writing in third person close. When Austen chooses to open to the reader the Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax affair, it is from the perspective of Knightley. So even though this whole book we've been following Emma, we've been following Emma's perspective, by keeping it in third person close rather than in first person, Austen can fairly naturally switch to Knightley's perspective and seeing what he's seeing and telling us about that. And that allows you know, the affair to be disclosed to the reader before it's disclosed to Emma herself. I'll link that video up above, but this is a, yet another really masterful example of how that technique is a very useful for, especially when you have sort of a secret subplot going on that you as the author know about, but maybe the reader doesn't know about yet, and certainly the characters in your story don't aren't fully informed of. One thing that I think is really interesting is we've talked a lot about this idea of riddles being prominent in this story, but also the structure of the story sort of being like a riddle for Emma to parse out and for us as readers to parse out. I even talked about my experience reading it the second time, feeling very similar to that experience of going back and watching The Sixth Sense or going back and watching Memento and looking for those clues that were there, but you just didn't know how to interpret yet. And along with that, I wanted to take a little like side trip down like the names that we have. First of all, the first one I thought was of was Frank, because Frank is not Frank, right? He's not open, he's not honest, he's not candid, he's not um, one who's going to disclose on a, a first level. The other one that I thought of is Highbury, too. So we have the sense that the people in Highbury, they don't go to London. They're kind of, maybe there's a, a culture of snobbery that extends beyond Emma herself. Maybe there's this culture of like, they're too high and they like their little community heart field. So Emma's schemes for hearts, right? So there's a play on words there. And we see that this is not exclusive to this book. North Anger is another one. Man's Field is another one where we have sort of words and meanings built into these places and names and towns and that sort of thing. And that's always fun to think about how that might be interpreted in light of the plot of the novel. As we see Emma actually, you know, going through this anonorisis that we've talked about before, this opening of her eyes, this unblinding process, she realizes how blind she's been and she goes and she has new perspective, fresh perspective. She sees herself and the world in a fresh way. Part of her process in doing that is actually abdicating some of her power. She gives over her own past prejudices and interpretation of reality in order to give power actually to Mr. Knightley to sort of approve and reprove of her actions and choices, which are the embodiment of her worldview in reality. Now, this is something that I kind of allude to by using that type of language fairly frequently in a lot of my talks and even in my, my own worldview, but it's basically this idea that your convictions need action, that your convictions need to literally be embodied in you as a person and put into action. And we see this with Emma. It's kind of like this Christian ideal of repenting or whatever, but it's Emma sort of going back and not behaving the way that she used to, ignoring Miss Bates or ignoring Jane Fairfax, but giving them their due and behaving more properly. And she's putting, you know, embodiment to the ethic that she now is going to adhere to or believes to be better. <laughs> Emma's a bit dramatic about the evils committed by Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax in their secret engagement. She's a little bit over the top about it, but 
at the same time, she also has a really forgiving heart as much as she is willing to forgive herself, which is quite willing. She's, she's not one to stay low or to, you know, really castigate herself about the bad behavior that she's done. She has a pretty high uh, sense of self-esteem, which we know, but also just what you might call high spirits, where she recovers fairly e easily from her blunders. And so I think that's something that she also extends to other people, and that's another good aspect of Emma's character. I feel like I talked negatively about her in a lot of videos, but by the end of the novel, she has a really great redemption arc, and that's nice. But also, I'm kind of just glad to be done reading it. <laughs> After her moment of anorexis and Emma really seeing how blind that she's been, we then have the interaction between Harriet Smith and Emma where they come to realize that Emma was thinking that Harriet's falling in love with Frank Churchill, but in fact Harriet has been falling in love with Mr. Knightley this whole time. And this is the first instance that we actually see Emma judging rightly. She's now encountered the truth of reality and that gives her greater clarity moving forward because she's submitting to the truth. And what she judges rightly about is the fact that Mr. Knightley is, you know, inquiring about Miss Harriet, Miss Harriet Smith's heart, not for himself, but for Robert Martin. She brings up this possibility. She doesn't force it on Harriet, but she, it's like the first sort of possibility that comes to mind of why Mr. Knightley might be giving Harriet such attentions. Um, and that's the first time that she has actually judged rightly into the hearts and minds of somebody else. Or even herself. Because as we know, Emma has been wrong this entire time. Okay, enough about that. As Emma considers all the changes that are to come to Highbury, she has to face the sort of ultimate threat of death. This comes back to the death fear that we talked about much earlier on. The ultimate type of death is the refusal to change, the refusal um, to move when life calls upon you to move, the uh, calcification of the self, the calcification of culture, in fact. And this is the downside of traditionalism over and against progressivism. And we see, you know, uh, I've talked about this on several of the videos now that we've been discussing Jane Austen so extensively, but this slipperiness with Jane, where we're not sure if she's progressive or if she's traditionalist and where she lands on that spectrum. But what we do see her sort of parsing out for us very clearly is that there's dangers to being extreme on both sides. To be so, so extremely traditional is to fall into the trap of tyranny, is to fall into the trap of lifelessness, of death. That's what that all symbolically represents. But to fall into the trap of excessive progressivism on the other end of the spectrum, that has its own dangers as well, which, which Emma is constantly warning against. That is to be without any of the structures of society is to be in chaos. Um, but anyway, <laughs> getting back to this particular novel, we have the Westons are having a baby soon. That means that Mrs. Weston is going to be much more involved in her own life and less so available for Emma and Mr. Um, Woodhouse. Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax are getting married, and it's just about the time that Emma's first really coming to accept what a great companion and friendship she might have with Jane Fairfax because they're treating each other in the way that they deserve to be treated. But they're going to go live at Enscombe, so they're not going to stay in Highbury. We know that um, Smith is potentially going to get married. At this point, Emma is imagining what if she marries Mr. K, Mr. Knightley, and then they would be cloistered and, you know, not cloistered, but they would be just much more involved in their own lives at Donwell Abbey. So Emma is viewing the, you know, the stretch of her days before her as a single woman in Hartfield taking care of her father until her father's dies, and she kind of realizes that's not as attractive a proposition as she originally thought. And even much earlier when Harriet first asked her about whether or not she would get married and Emma sort of lightheartedly says, oh, with such mental powers as mine, you know, I would never be without, without occupation. And the things that she lists off are like, I don't know if that's going to be enough to sustain you for the rest of your life is like doing needlepoint and carpet work and that's, that's not enough of a life to live for. And I think that this is, you know, just dawning upon Emma as she cons imaginatively considers what her future might look like under these new circumstances. And this is how self-indulgence and self-protection actually kill you. And this goes back to my last episode of like, why you have to be willing to make mistakes, to move out into the land of chaos, to move out into the unknown, encounter reality. It's going to be battles. It's going to be painful. But the alternative is death. The alternative is calcification. The alternative is loneliness. The alternative is tyranny. And, and that's 
that's really much worse. I talked about this a little bit when I did the interview with the Lawn Gnome last month where we talked about classic books. And, and this is something that I talk about a lot kind of at a higher level because of course classic books have carry with them a traditionalist worldview, but there is a downside to it. One of the things on, on the other side of it is like with cancel culture in our society, we touched on that a little bit, but it actually is relevant here because stepping out into the unknown and into the chaotic realm where you're not sure what you're going to face, where you're not as, you know, uh, proficient as you are in the world in which you're familiar, again, we see that with Emma, I talked about that on Friday, means that you're layering then another deterrent on top of what is already naturally there in our human nature. And cancel culture just means that not only are you gonna get smacked by nature, you know, symbolic mother nature when you make a mistake or you act out of line, but now you're gonna get smacked by father culture or father time, if you will, by this like tyrannical force, social force sort of coming down on you and saying like, no, you did that thing incorrectly and we're gonna completely cancel you. And, and it's just too much for one person to really encounter, I think. I think it's a, that's partially why we need culture is to actually be kind of like a soft place to land and be like, oh, here are the structures of right ways of doing things. Let me dust myself up and get myself back out there, back out into chaos, because that's enough of a threat for life. This is me getting philosophical. One thing that we also see coming full circle in this novel, and this is not an idea that it, unfortunately is original to me, I wish it were, but it's actually from the introduction by Stephen Marcus, who I obviously said like I didn't really like his writing, but I thought this was a really, really brilliant observation. The story really kicks off with the story of Mr. Weston's first wife, which is Miss Churchill, and that's obviously how he had Frank Churchill, and how Miss Churchill really regretted ultimately marrying Mr. Weston, even though she was in love with him, because she was torn between these two identities. She wanted to be Miss Churchill of Enscombe as well as Mrs. Weston. But in the conclusion of this novel, we actually see Emma bringing that to fulfillment because Mr. Knightley is willing to come to live at Hartfield as long as her father is, al is alive to help ease that transition of her marriage and so that he doesn't have to live alone and by himself for the rest of his life. And so we see that Emma functionally fulfills that. She gets to be Mrs. Knightley as well as Miss Woodhouse of Hartfield. And it just brings everything full circle. Brilliant observation on his part. Another thing that I've talked about that also gets resolved in this novel is this traditional role of masculine power that Emma is fulfilling with her competency, with her wealth, with her status, etc., etc. And I mentioned that either she was going to have to have a feminizing force, which she did through her own sort of humiliation or humbling experience of the anorisis, but the other thing is that perhaps the man that she would end up with would also be take a more feminine role in with respect to her power. And that's also true, even though Mr. Knightley is perfectly manly and he's perfectly masculine, the reality is, is that he's coming to Hartfield instead of her going to Donwell, which is the traditional structure of things. And by him abdicating his right to sort of call his wife over to his life and become, you know, again, Mrs. Knightley of Donwell Abbey, he is abdicating that right in order to facilitate, you know, this, this unusual situation with her family. And I think the other reason why Emma's feelings finally get resolved is she finally has to come face to face with her own feelings for Mr. Knightley. And it only happens when an interloper comes along. Now this goes back to Freudian psychology and Freudian theory of psychology, which is totally not accurate, but it's interesting to think about just for funsies with this book. Um, this idea of the Oedipal complex or the electric complex or whatever, we talked about how Mr. Knightley fulfills a fatherly role for Emma, and that's what makes it kind of awkward for her to sort of transition into viewing him in a romantic light. And the idea of an interloper, that's the idea that, you know, as a child, you bond with your opposite sex parent, and then the interloper you see as like the person that they're actually married to, you know, your your mother or father respectively. And so for a woman, it's like she wants to kill her mother so that she can, you know, psychologically fulfill her romantic desires for her father. It's really gross to think about and really creepy, but there is this sense of like, oh, when an interloper comes along and it sort of inspires you to kind of realize like, oh, I've been having these feelings for this person for a long time. Now, whether, you know, Freudian theory <laughs> applies here or not, 
definitely that idea of competition coming in with Mr. Knightley and, and Harriet makes Emma realize that she's had feelings for Mr. Knightley this whole time. And it becomes even more interesting and doubly complex because Harriet Smith is a double for Emma. It's her own doppelganger that she's sort of like a golem. She's formed out of the mud to sort of like go off and do her, to do her bidding, right? But then when she realizes that the, the double that she sent off into reality to fight her battles for her, in fact, is going to win the prize of the, of fighting your battles in reality, then she gets really upset and she's now willing to go out and take a risk. And the risk is, of course, in the conversation with Mr. Knightley, which she almost doesn't take. She almost makes him stop talking before she comes back and says, like, okay, anything that you have to tell me, even if it would give me pain, I want to hear it as your friend. And then, of course, we have the resolution of the novel. So, anyway, those are just wrapping up, you know, the 65,000 things that I noticed about this novel. It's fine. This video is not too long. It's whatever. So, <laughs> I was planning on talking about all of Jane Austen's novels, and I did finish reading Mansfield Park, Northanger Abbey, Lady Susan, and The Watsons, but I'm so sick and tired of talking about Jane Austen that it's not going to happen. So, unless you really, really beg and plead and ask and leave a lot of comments on my video or something like that, I suppose that's what good YouTubers do. Subscribe, like, leave a comment. But do subscribe if you like my channel. Not making fun of other YouTubers. I understand. It's a grind. But instead, because I'm not really in the mood to read even more Austen, which ironically only Persuasion and Sanditon were left, and Persuasion is, if not number one, tied for first place for me with Mansfield. Persuasion, I think, is, uh, in my opinion, Austen's best work. And I'm foregoing that because I have read so much Austin, I'm ready to do something else and talk about something else. So I am going to read The Song of Roland, which is by an unknown author. It's a medieval French poem in this sort of courtly style, in this epic style. It is a chanson de geste, a song of deeds. So we're gonna hear about noble knights fighting battles. You guys know I love medieval literature. I absolutely love it. And you know, not a lot of people necessarily talk about the medieval literature on booktube that I have seen. We get a lot of Austin, we get a lot of Victorian literature, but not so much older or newer things. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this also because I feel like reading it. And this is my channel, so I read what I want. It's translated by Dorothy L. Sayers, and I feel like I've heard her name a lot. She must do a lot of translation work, or she must be quite the scholar for me to actually be like, oh, that name sounds familiar because I'm not well-versed in, in this area of academia at all. And I'm just a few pages into the introduction, only about 25 pages in. And so I wanted to go over a couple of notes that I think will set a good groundwork for us as we discuss this story. I've not read it before, so you're gonna get my live in the moment reactions analysis as I first encounter this story. And so what I'm about to tell you is just material that I've learned from the introduction. This is not stuff that I particularly know. I'm just like digesting it and sharing it with you guys. Because this is an epic story, we do start in media res. And I'm going to refer a lot to like my Iliad and Odyssey videos. I'll link them up above because epic structure is the same. <laughs> There's a lot of similarities, I should say. So I talked about in media rest, I'm sure, with at least both of those, if not one. But that basically means it's starting in the middle of things. And there's very much a sense, as with the Iliad, as with the Odyssey, that this story is just one of a grander set of tales that the audience would have been familiar with. Um, in the case of the Iliad and the Odyssey, we have a lot of fragments and they were repurposed by Greek tragedians, by uh, other people <laughs> writing about it, whether it's in Ovid or other people writing down these myths and stories and re retelling them in their own style. So we can really piece together the grander narrative that the Iliad and the Odyssey are a part of. So we get the story of Agamemnon before and after. We get the returns of several of the Greek kings coming back from Troy, not just Odysseus's story. However, with the Song of Roland, we don't know what the grander context is. We just know that there is one because there's so much where it's presumed that the re audience knows what this performer would have been sharing about and talking about. One of the things that we can sort of presume is that Roland, who's the main character, and Oliver, 
have had a long-term friendship before this began, so that's something to keep in mind if you're reading this along with me. Count Galanon is actually Roland's stepfather, and it seems clear that they've had conflict in the past and that there's, you know, sort of bad blood between them, a lot of bitterness. And so that sort of assumed the audience, it's assumed that the audience knows this. And then the other thing to kind of keep in mind is that reading epic poetry like this, especially when it would have been performed by a bard, but very similarly to what I talked about when we did our Iliad video and our introduction to that, is that it, it's kind of helpful to read it as though you're reading a play in the same kind of mindset because it would have been performed and it would have been even a little bit extemporaneous. So the, the bards and the singers who would come to the French court to tell these stories as for entertainment for the upper class, that, you know, they would have the opportunity to sort of fiddle with the story and expand bits and pieces here and there before, or by responding to the audience and kind of feeling out what they're really enthusiastic about or cutting short parts where they're not really paying attention, et cetera, et cetera. So viewing it as a play, viewing it as a performance, viewing it as something sort of malleable, even though the bones of the story would have remained the same, I think is really helpful when you go into reading a book like this. And then finally, this is, you know, a myth that has grown up out of a real historical circumstance. So the introduction again, I am a horrible student of history at this period of time. Even though I love medieval literature, I don't have the best grasp of this, so I'm just referring to what's in here. But apparently there was a battle in 733 in which Charlemagne agreed to help one part of Spain fight another part of Spain. And he was actually in the middle of his own battle at the time, but he sent off a contingent of soldiers and they went off and fought. But at then Charlemagne had, already had to bring them back because of his own battles that he was fighting. And on their return, they were sort of like bombarded. What's the word that I'm looking for? Like a secret attack. I don't know. But anyway, they uh, and were kind of like killed in this sort of like narrow pass where they, they were sort of you know, the, the, the enemy had a huge advantage. And so they were, this whole contingent of um, mounted soldiers were just killed. And Roland was one of the uh, lords, you know, recorded in by the contemporary historians of the time, sort of saying he was among the party and he was among the people who died there. And so then we don't hear anything about this story for about 300 years, pops back up in the 1100s, and it's now this sort of mythic, legendary, you know, exciting, epic story by the time that we see it popping up again. So that is what we're going to talk about. We do have a conflict be between sort of like French Christians versus the Spanish Moors, the Muslims, the East versus the West, you know, so these greater concepts of coming into conflict are then being represented in this one particular historical event on epic scale. So that was a really long video, a really long update. Good for you if you stuck around for all of my discussion of Emma. This has actually been really, really fun, so I'm gonna keep it up. And this is a book that I'm totally unfamiliar with. So unlike Austin, where I'd read it a whole bunch of times, this might be a little bit more of a challenge for me to create content and concepts around, but you'll get to see my reading process and hopefully it's something that you enjoy and that you can get something out of. Until next time, my name is Alexandra. And guess what? I am still a bibliophile. <laughs>